You're listening to the You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Find more great shows like this at WeAreLibertarians.com. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at WeAreLibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. It is great to join you tonight. Thank you to everybody that is tuning in. Feel free to comment. We'll see those and we'll uh, involve you in the conversation. Going to talk about abuses of power and uh, all the politicians are going to get it. Not just Donald Trump, but the Michigan governor. Oh, boy. So we're going to talk about uh, all these petty tyrants that are out there. So stay tuned. We'll return right after this. Warning, this show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Welcome to the program. My name is Chris Spangle, as that fancy voiced man says. Thank you for being here tonight. Going live to my personal Facebook for the first time, and uh, welcome to everybody that is watching on the big Facebook page. Welcome to everybody that is going to join us on YouTube, eventually. Uh, we are going to talk about abuse of power tonight, and with me, as always, are my faithful and friendly co-hosts. Harry, how are you tonight? Going good. It uh, was uh, my first day back at work after uh, being in quarantine. Did you go into work, or are you still at home? I actually went in today, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And how was it? Because I desperately want to go back to work. I'm so <laughs> Everyone was there was annoyed, but I was like ecstatic to see humans again and be able to talk with people and go to people and go see people. Yeah, I loved, it. I loved every moment of it. You know, uh, I'm right. sure I annoyed a few people because I wouldn't go away and I'm on the verge of hugging. Okay, very close to hugging. Ooh, that's like a hate crime now. I know, right? Just, I had to go. I had to go to the grocery store, and uh, it felt like I was doing something wrong. And everybody there looked like they were. Nobody made eye contact. It was just dirty. Reinhold, you know what that's like when you go out of the house. You try not to make eye contact. You just oh, there's all right. There's been this fly in my apartment for the last <laughs> few days. This is the bane of my existence, Reinhold. <laughs> like I, this fly lands up it's on my face. It's driving me up a wall. I I have tried to kill it, and it's the slowest fly ever. It's just like, but and and I'm quick, and it won't let me kill it, Reinhold. Well, I mean, it's not practicing social distancing, so that's right. You need to you need to punish it and put it down. I really do. How, how so have, him up somehow. You're you work from home all the time, so you're not upset at all. Nah, I mean, it is. Yeah, uh, it's not that much different. So, yeah. Me, so it doesn't bother me. I just kind of get a chuckle about everybody having the, um, freaking out about being home for a few weeks. Like, <laughs> it seems like a a dream to me. But. Yeah. So, <laughs> also joining us is I don't know how to say your name, Brian Wolgamuth. Wolgamuth. Yep. Wolgamuth. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know you've told me before, but I, yeah. I'm so bad. At it. So I talk to Brian every day and have for like the last year, but this is the first time I probably should do this. Uh, this is the first time that uh, I've actually talked to Brian face to face. Is that true? <laughs> uh, pretty much other than saying hi in 2016. That's about it. All right. So very glad to have all of you here. Let's start our conversation about the abuse of power. With this butte, with this butte. Understanding of your authority vis-a-vis -vis governors. Uh, just to be very specific. For instance, if a governor issued a state home, when you say my authority, the president's authority. Not mine, because it's not me. This is when somebody's the president of the United States. The authority is total, and that's the way it's got to be. Your authority is total. It's total. It's total. And the governors know that. So if the governors know that, now you have a couple of bands of. of excuse me. Excuse me. You have a cup. Did you receive that order? 
you have a couple of bands of uh, of uh, Democrat governors, but they will agree to it. They will agree to it. But uh, the authority of the president of the United States having to do with the subject we're talking about is total. Uh, we're going to write up papers on this. It's not going to be necessary because the governors need us one way or the other, because ultimately it comes with the federal government. That being said, we're getting along very well with the governors, and I feel very certain that uh, there won't be a problem. So, <laughs> when I saw it, I think I first saw it on Justin Amash's Twitter. When I saw the actual words, I just can't believe that somebody said the quiet parts out loud. That The reality is that the cult of the presidency has grown, and we have, have shifted from... Uh, a, a, an executive branch that is there basically to be a check on Congress where most of the power is supposed to lie and turned the presidency into something that is, um, I mean, how, how would you describe it, Reinhold? Or it, it, It's like uh, we have turned them into a king and, and Donald Trump, and he believes that he is king and he believes that he can speak into existence whatever he'd like. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually not really anything new. If you look at all the different legal opinions that um, and, and issues that the president's been involved with, his legal team always says he has full authority, he has no oversight, he can do whatever he wants. Right. So um, to hear him say that to me wasn't a, a surprise. It was just a surprise that uh, he finally said it on camera when uh, nobody could dispute the fact that he's saying this. But um one thing he did say in that thing, though, is that he he did try to caveat it. I think I don't know if he did it subconsciously, where he's saying in this in this matter or this thing we're talking about, he, he has full authority. So he's probably just talking about the um, emergency powers, you know, act that he put into place. But it's it's still in line with everything he said since he's been running for office. And you've been a long time. Trump critic and and Brian and I are always the check on your power, Reinhold, uh, in the group chat. Um, and it's not that you've been wrong about Donald Trump. I mean, for me, it's always been pick your spot. Like, what are we going to choose to criticize Donald Trump about? Let's save it for the stuff that's super important. Like, oh, I don't know, saying I have absolute authority and I don't understand the Constitution. And the Tenth Amendment says that. Uh, everything not enumerated in the Constitution is left to the states because the states created the federal government. The federal government didn't create the states. And and so this is one of those times where I go, this is uh, this is something that needs to be criticized. And and the but the reality is you're starting to see Donald Trump's authoritarian tendencies come out in a very serious way. I mean, in it, it, and. I, I mean, the press conference yesterday, the part that we haven't mentioned was the bizarre video where, you know, it's when he does stuff like this and it kind of makes you laugh because it's funny. But, you know, he shows this. He goes, some of you are not getting it. Let me show you. And like shows this campaign video to the press, makes them all sit there. They're all watching it. And it's like five out of context quotes from early January of people saying, this is nothing to worry about. The flu is much more dangerous, which in January in America, I thought it was, yeah. the flu was much more dangerous than coronavirus. Um, that isn't true now. And those people probably don't think the same thing that they thought in January. Neither do any of us on this panel or any, any people listening. I'm sure like if you think the same thing about coronavirus, now versus January 27th, well, then where have you been? Yeah. Um, but and then he goes on and then he like, you know, the video then goes, here's all the stuff that Trump has done. And it's shutting down the borders with China because of accidental racism. And then it like magically flies to March. Yeah. <laughs> like we're just supposed to ignore that it flies to March. And it was it was just propaganda. There is no other word than a president. And let me say this to people who are watching who are, are Trump fans. Donald Trump is the president and Donald Trump is the government and Donald Trump is a politician. And so Donald Trump, when he says things, uh, he, it has the force of the president behind it, of the government behind it. And he is a politician trying to manipulate you for his own personal gain. And so you have to remember that. You, I think everybody is so quick 
to give a, a, a pass, and I'm going to mute you, Brian, so if you want to talk, you're going to have to unmute yourself, but uh, the, I, like I see so many Republican commentators who are wanting to hold Dr. Fauci account accountable. You know, two days ago, yesterday, the whole thing was we got to fire Dr. Fauci. Okay, well, that guy's an advisor, a low-level bureaucrat who's been in the government forever, but he's making he's giving advice to the president who is the decider. So if you have a problem with what Dr. Fauci is doing, why don't you have a problem with the guy who makes the decisions? the guy who puts out the guidelines that the president is acting on. So it, it never seems to process it, Reinhold, in my mind. Like, I never understand why some people are willing to hold a Dr. Fauci accountable and not Donald Trump. But I guess it's because Donald Trump is telling those people to hold Dr. Fauci accountable. Well, Trump actually hasn't really said anything about it. It's been more of the... Um kind of the fringe elements of society and the right that have been trying to find some reason to blame this all on the people that they don't like. And it just, to them, they feel like it, this is all hysteria. This is all blown out of proportion. And this is just the way that the government's going to come and lock us down into a, uh, a new society where we can't do anything without go without government permission. We can't wipe our nose without government permission, all that stuff. So they believe that that's the goal and that the reason for doing for, for this whole thing isn't because uh, a terrible virus mutated and got spread around. It's because we want this to be the situation. We want everybody scared so we can implement all these policies. So when they see someone like Dr. Fauci up there saying things that uh, are are not Pollyanna-ish, they they tend to think that he's the the front leader for that movement of uh, trying to scare everybody. When in reality, what he's trying to do is trying to inform everybody so they can make a good decision off of the actual information and not what you know people want it to be. I th I think that's a crucial distinction that a lot of people are not understanding information is different than scaremongering like uh I, you know ron paul who i was critical on last episode i hope you go take a listen uh, uh is accusing people of scaremongering into getting the the new vaccine for coronavirus well i don't know how this isn't scaremongering itself because the vi the vaccine is there's several vaccines that are in development but there isn't a vaccine and how can you make an informed decision about a vaccine that doesn't exist? And so if you're telling people not to get it, you're sort of scaremongering about what may happen in the future months or years when a vaccine is or is not available. So you have to like people talking about a vaccine and giving us information is not the same thing as fear mongering. I don't you know, it's sort of a weird impulse, Brian, that that people are are are, are, are confusing and conflating information and and scaremongering right and, and i think part of it runs into the whole idea that you know that there's a there's a group that says we have to test everything but then you know a new vaccine's going to come on everyone has to take it well okay but the next question is do you take the flu vaccine every year because i got news for you it's the same frigging process that's run along to do the flu vaccine every year same models same everything same mostly guesswork untested vaccine that everybody gets recommended to take over a certain age and you get the flu vaccine and you know, you go on from there. So it's going to be the same models for that. So if they're freaking out about the coronavirus vaccine, well, uh, have you been getting flu vaccines for the past 10 years? If so, it's the same thing, but people don't realize that they think that it's, you know, either scaremongering of, you know, somebody's trying to make money off this, or if uh, somebody's just trying to control you by injecting you with 5G or whatever it is. Well, I think that there is uh, some that's sort of happening with hydro hydroxychloroquine. And, and this is sort of uh, emblematic of where our politics are at today. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know Reese Bryant has followed it very closely, was the first person in my circle to kind of tell me about it. Uh, and I think it encapsulates so much. In that, uh, here's this potential drug 
the, the potential treatment that I know people in my personal circles who have been given it and it seems to work, yep. you know, and it seems to help right now. It's a 70 year old malaria drug. It, it is, is a known quantity for treating malaria, right? And the side effects are known in certain circumstances, but if you're giving a drug for a different treatment, there may be different dosages. There right. may be different ways that you use it. You don't know how it interacts with the fucking <laughs> how it interacts with other things um and, and so you have this potential hopeful treatment that comes out and donald trump comes out and he and he wants to goose the market to get his economy back up his economy back up mm -hmm. because he wants to get reelected, and so he really pushes this notion and so people listen to this and they go oh i should get some of that and then you you have the doctor on facebook that's selling 50 dollars prescriptions for this stuff because yeah. You want to use it as a prophylactic, which is a preventative measure. Take this. Well, you could you could seriously damage your heart, right? Like so, the, it 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 goes one way, and people get over hyped about something, and then there's the reactionary side of the press, which can't give Donald Trump a, a pass on anything, right. and they go. Well, this has not been tested yet. There have only been one. There's only been one study, and it was not done to to our standards. And I don't care if it's working in 400 different hospitals, but it's not been tested the way that I think it ought to be tested. And so they get their expert to say that in the New York Times or whatever, or go on CNN and Sanjay Gupta, Gupta craps all over it. So, and then regular people are sitting there going, "Okay, is this the miracle hope?" drug treat like everybody should take this or is this the worst thing that i've ever heard i don't know what's going on i'm tired of being in the middle of this fight and the reality is the press and cnn and donald trump shouldn't be talking about this at all <laughs> it should be the decision of a local doctor who has hands on a patient who is caring for a patient and somebody in Washington, D.C., be it in CNN, the FDA, or the White House, shouldn't necessarily have an opinion on it. Do trials. Do studies. Okay. Do it through private research, John Hopkins, and then let doctors make the decision based on those trials or give the patient the option for something what's called right to try. Right. You know, right, Brian? I mean, that it seems to me that I'm not – the crazy one here, right? No, you're not. And, and the funny thing is this, is that I, I, I saw Trump when he did that and he brought that up and I'd already been talking about it. There's already been a lot of healthcare before that time, before Trump even said anything. So him going out and saying it, yeah, it didn't really help. You know, the person taking fishbowl cleaner because it said hydroxychloroquine and, and, and unfortunately passing away, that's a side effect of doing that. But that being said, is like you said, there's like a, a true Trump derangement syndrome. Oh, my God, he said this. He's not a doctor. So we should never, ever do this without great, you know, big studies. But the one thing you run into is those studies take a lot of time. And usually if the government's running it, it takes even more time. So, I mean, you can do a small study in a hospital, 30, 40 patients, but that's not big enough. You need multiple hospitals, multiple protocols, and it takes usually six, nine months. Now, just imagine if there was no treatment and we were on six, nine months of lockdown because of we couldn't cure anybody other than, you know, follow the South Korean protocol, which was essentially inject a bunch of vitamin C into them um, or, you know, just basically try some other drugs like uh, Gileazrim and I think I'm probably pronounced that horribly wrong, um, which showed some benefits to it. But once again, you know, that's going to take time to do it. But, and Trump going out and saying it, I kind of see it 50-50. It's kind of one of those things that the FDA and CDC and NIH are going to take months to go ahead and do something that's already being said. Him saying it at least kind of kicks people to say, yeah, maybe we should look at it a little bit quicker. Reinhold, Harry. Harry, you're off like quiet. One, because Gunther's behind me with an xylophone just banging it behind my door. Uh, I think you got into your Easter candy. <laughs> Sugar rush for the kid, huh? Oh, man, I think so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so okay, well, you let, let's, let's, let's let Ryan hold. He was going to speak anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that I don't think there's been a better example of why you don't want government involved in medicine 
or the medical community or any decision that you have to make with you and your doctor. That should be left to them. The doctors should be able to get together and discuss, which they do. They discuss this thing, the off-label usage for these medicines. So it's perfectly legal right now for a doctor to prescribe this medicine off-label to a patient if he feels that it is going to give them the best chance of success in, in fighting this disease or this is this virus. So that should be between them. Why are we getting anybody in the government involved in that decision just to put politics in the middle of that makes no sense to me. I won't keep the politics out of that decision between the doctor and the patient. Uh, one thing I chime in on that is that you have the exact opposite effect. I mean, if after Trump says that you have Whitmer and then the governor out in Nevada who specifically put out guidance that basically said that you're not to give hydroxychloroquine to anyone for COVID-19. And I'm just sitting there going, this is insane. You're going the, the wrong direction. If you want to go ahead and dissuade it, fine, dissuade it. Tell them in the hospitals, everywhere else. But to sit there and actively then fight against it just because, and well, they were both Democrat governors, uh, to go out there and do that doesn't isn't a good look for them either. Now, and one of them is, one of those Democrat governors is also on a short list of possible vp candidates too so yeah i mean yeah. there's some campaigning going on there as oh, well yeah. we'll get to the governor of <laughs> michigan in a moment uh I've got, I've got some harsh words from tucker carlson for for her well we're gonna do the republicans first then we'll get to the democrats i mean harry but this just speaks to why people self-reliance is most important it should be self-government and, and it should be you making an informed choice about your doctor and mm -hmm. and and then this i'm going to kill this fly uh, <laughs> well like and that and so people so much rely on it on the government is the reason why someone decided to you know go to the aquarium store to go get this cleaner you know with no understanding of dosage or something like that because you know the magic box from this magic person told him that like hey if you go and take these magic pills dissolve in the, in the magic water it'll make you magically healed you know right so it, it, there's no there's no science behind it be you know because they never had to think like, oh, they said this will be fine, you know, and and the adverse chemicals. And the other thing is the lack of science behind anything. That's why some people are believing that 5G is going to do this to them, which the only people that need to, you know, really, really be scared of 5G is broadband cable providers who jacked up the price and had a monopoly. That's the only people who need to be like scared of 5G, you know. Do we want to divert off onto the 5G conspiracy? <laughs> do we want to like take a tangent? I mean, hold your voice of reason. What do you I work in telecom, so yeah, I, I love it. Okay, so all right, I, because I'm not I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I'm like, I don't know. This seems I I read some funny things and I listen to No Agenda, and I'm like, eh, it's got a lot of microwaves, and is it going to microwave my insides? And like, why are they doing the inner city first? That alone seems suspicious. That it's not coming to the white neighborhoods first; it's going to the inner city. Let's test it out on the economically disadvantaged. And then and then I'm reading, you know, but then you get to like the people who think that Z created 5G uh, or created the coronavirus to be activated by 5G. And so now the coronavirus is infecting the world and Z in China can has activated with 5G technology all the coronavirus in the world and it's mind control, man. I literally saw that. And the person was not kidding. Uh, so I, I get and now you, you know, in England, they're burning down 5G towers in neighborhoods. There was literally people tore down a 5G and lit it on fire, a 5G uh, tower. So are any of you familiar with the 5G conspiracy? Like, what is the thing? And is, is it going to give me cancer? No. No. Not, not a chance. So, Do you own a microwave? I own a microwave, yeah. Okay. That puts out 1,500 watts usually, 12, 1,500 watts of power. Your average 5G transmitter is going to be around maybe topping out at one, maybe two. So, yeah, I mean, uh, unless you don't like microwaving popcorn, that's going to do a lot more damage to you than anything else. So what I'm hearing exactly. is I should stop using my microwave. Yeah, exactly. It's going to turn, okay. it's going to turn you, it's going to turn the coronavirus and you're going to want to buy a bunch of frogs and things like that. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. the sun is more dangerous than that. You know, yeah. going out in the sun. Everybody wants to go out in the sun because they've been cooped up, right? Going right. out in the sun is more dangerous than that. If you look at the – so 
the way the way these waves work is that there's a certain frequency, right? So at lower frequencies or at specific frequencies like less than light frequencies, those fre those electromagnetic frequencies pass through the body without harm. They're called non-ionizing radi radiation. So it doesn't uh, affect anything as it passes through. The way the microwave works is not because of uh, frequency, it's because of amplitude, because the wave is so strong, there's so much power behind it, that's when the damage, the the uh, the effects in it has on the body starts to take effect. It heats up those molecules. It heats up the water molecules. <laughs> if you were to stand in front of a, so I used to work in the in the Navy, and I used to work on radar equipment um, when I was running. When I was learning how to run nuclear power plant, and learning how all this physics works. Um, and if you would stand in front of one of these large radar dishes, you know you're you're not going to have a good day, but <laughs> It, it was fine for you to well, be. Well, you what know, happened? Would you like crap your pants? Or like, well, well, no, it'd be like going out in the sun if the earth was, you know, half the distance it is now from, from the sun. Oh, okay. You would, it would just be, it would, you, you would just burn. Your face would burn. Um, and, that, and that's what we, when we go out and get a sunburn or get a lot of sun, that's what we're doing. We're, we're taking that uh, radiation in. Right. So because the the light spectrum is, is going to be at a higher frequency than the microwave spectrum or the the uh, 5G spectrum or the uh, lower AM radios and things like that. Um, now, when you get to the other side, into the infrared and gamma rays and all that sort of thing, and the X-rays, those are ionizing radiations and they can damage you. They have um, radioactive properties and they can mess with your body. That's why we don't give people X-rays just every week because you know uh, overexposure to that can cause damage megan, so that's, that's, megan asked in, in the comments if you were on a nuke were you on a nuclear sub i um i was in i was not on a sub and i was in school for like two years and then as i graduated school and was getting ready to go out to the fleet they discovered a problem with my knees and discharged me literally every one of these comments has been ladies that's, that's encouraging. La ladies listening to a libertarian podcast. How great is that? Harry, would you ever, did you ever think you'd see the day uh, that we'd have ladies watching this show? Well, on Twitch, we get that all the time. So, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. what, what, do you, what do you think about the 5G conspiracy? How oh, bad? See, like, it's been going on for weeks. Everyone was talking about how, like, dangerous, like, one that GSM has been, or just how, like, all these radio frequencies was. I've tried to tell people, like, dude, I've slept on top of a GSM tower. You're fine. I had a kid sleeping on top of a GSM tower. Trust me, you're fine. Um, all right. All right. Well, if Harry says you're fine, Harry's the most <laughs> paranoid person I know. Um, yeah, I just it, it's amazing to me how much conspiratorial talk there is out there. And it's it's like everyone is a 9-11 truther mm -hmm. in real time. Like, you know, with 9-11 trutherism, at least they gave us a couple of years to get ourselves organized and let the, the conspiracies kind of roll. But, man, it's it's just happening like in real time. Like the I, I addressed it yesterday. If you didn't listen to the last episode that I posted a couple of days with Lex about the basics of coronavirus, I encourage you to go check that that out because a there was uh, there was a section where I basically reveal some inside information. I'm basically a breaking news source now, so I need to get one of those little red pill tablet things on Facebook when I when I post this stuff, like the New York Times does, uh, because I'm a serious journalist. Uh, and we talk about some stuff that's happening at the CDC because, as I've as I've said, the breads and circuses type shutdowns where they're not letting you go to restaurants, that's going to come back. That's like mm -hmm. one to two weeks away from coming back. But where they're really going to start eating away at your liberty is basically the Patriot Act for the healthcare system. Well, that's already happening in the CDC. I've got some people in there. I've got the documents and uh, the sources. And so I kind of outlined what happened there. Uh, and talk a little bit about uh, debunk the, the whole thing about if you die in a car accident, they're marking you as a COVID patient. Well, that's not true. And I explained the whole process about how the deaths are marked, explain incentive structures. Uh, and, you know, so we talked about incentives and how incentives really are, are the driving motivational force behind 
why people make good or bad decisions. What is the incentive you're putting in place? Well, today, I think the conversation in all this has to be consequences, right? Like, in, consequences are an important part of that that structure. So, in a free society, you know, it is all about consequences and incentives. And when it comes to, you know, Donald Trump, what consequences in, in what consequences does Donald Trump really face, right? It, he never really faces consequences because the people who are against him are always going to be against him. The media is always going to be against Donald Trump. He's never going to get the fair shake from the media that he thinks he deserves, right? The consequences come when people in his own circle start checking him. Like you saw Liz Cheney, you saw Rand Paul come out today and say that the president is wrong. I mean, watching the five tonight, with uh, Janine Pirro and all the uh, and Jesse Waters and all these r Republican conservative talk people, like they've made their whole career being friends with Trump and trying to do this dance around his comments. They 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 ignore the comments completely. They don't even say he's wrong. They don't want to say anything bad about the guy, and they just kind of shift it and they go. You know, well, you know, that's it's really the left that didn't ever talk about uh, federalism. And why are they talking about federalism now? They didn't talk about it back when Barack Obama was president. Well, aren't you glad they're talking about it now? Because I'm sitting here as a libertarian that believes in the 10th Amendment. And if we're going to have any government at all, let's have uh, let's not have this big centralized okay. state. Let's have it as small as possible, as Reinhold just said. Well, so if the Democrats are on board, the Republicans are on board, let's do this. But the Republicans don't want to do it now because we might have to say something bad about Donald Trump. And we don't want there to be consequences for Donald Trump. You know, the the reality is China and, and the, the person who's in charge of the World Health Organization, he was he's the first director from Africa. He's from Ethiopia. And uh, there has been significant investment from China in Ethiopia. He's basically their pick. The American pick was a guy from the United Kingdom. And so the head of the World Health Organization, they, they probably paid some people off and, and got their pick put in place at the head of the World Health Organization. Well, when it came net, when the time came around to fudge some stats, their boy was there for them and took care of them. And China did whatever they want wanted because at the end of the day, they didn't really think that they were going to face any consequences. In the South China Sea, for instance, if you look up the South China Sea, they're basically saying to the world that this strait of, of sea belongs to us. We're going to do with it what we want, and they're building bases. Well, nobody can do anything. When Russia invaded Crimea, nobody did anything. So all of these authoritarian states are seeing that there are really no consequences and I'm not advocating war because I know that's the initial knee-jerk reaction that everybody on social media wants to do. But there's no um, there's no real consequences for China to lie about the statistics because their boy was in charge, uh, their their friend was in charge of uh, the 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 person who was in charge of the who was was their friend, right? So the uh, the reality is consequences are everywhere. The people who want to go out of the house and don't want to believe that coronavirus is real, let them go out of the house. Let them suffer the consequences. The people who are going out are going to be the most affected. The people who don't think this is real that believe Donald Trump when he said erroneously that this wasn't real two months ago. Well, those people who believe anything Donald Trump says, they're the ones out shopping, right? Like you and I both know it. You see the people in Meyer, like the Meyer's a different story. You go to two weeks ago when you were going to stores, who were the people just going, this isn't real. This isn't it. It was the people who didn't think it was real. It says, well, that's because Donald Trump can say whatever he wants without consequences. Those people don't think that they're going to face consequences. So they don't change their behavior and they just continue to go out and do whatever they want. Let there be consequences to choices. That's how that's how we're going to really start reining things in. And it starts with us holding our own accountable. I'm very annoying. These guys will tell you I'm very annoying. And I and I uh, took Ron Paul to task today for trying to scaremonger around a potential vaccine. He's just playing to his base of anti-vax homeschools, homeschooler crowds like he knows he's going to get clicks. 
And when he gets clicks back to his website, he's going to get email signups. And then he can convert those people into buying the Ron Paul homeschool curriculum. So if he if he plays, if he grandstands for a certain audience that is more likely to buy his product that lines his pockets, then he will say whatever he wants because it benefits him directly. And so we as libertarians have to go, you're doing the same thing you're saying that they're doing at the New York Times. So why is this appropriate? It doesn't mean that uh, Ron Paul, Ron Paul's a human being. He's a uh, not a deity who can't be criticized, but people don't want to criticize Ron Paul in the movement because they don't want the backlash from the cult. There's a Ron Paul cult that he has cultivated over many years. And if you say something mean about Ron Paul online, your day is ruined. Uh, so you need to, just, if you don't believe me, just go on and, and say, I don't agree with Ron Paul saying that coronavirus was a hoax. He literally wrote an article three weeks ago that says coronavirus is a hoax. Then uh, last week, the Ron Paul Institute puts out an article that says, if you die in a car accident, you're going to get marked as a COVID death. Now, the guy was using it as a hypothetical, but people go online and push that as a conspiratorial line. It's all over our social media. And so it's dependent upon people like uh, Reinhold, myself, Harry, and and other libertarian outlets to go. This is not the this is not the reality. This is how the system is actually working. There's plenty of there's plenty of arguments against government interference right now without making up nonsense. And so you know that's what a lot of the last episode was about. So I don't want to get too too deep into that, but that's why people really come up with a lot of these conspiracy theories in my mind, guys, because it. It helps them. They have the secret knowledge. You don't need to listen to them. They have the secret knowledge that uh, the New York Times won't tell you. And isn't it funny how they always just constantly, like there's a lot of problems with the media. And there's a lot of people who have just anything that Chuck Todd says is the truth. You know, and, and that's sort of why I love having the Swamp Explained episodes where we talk to Rob Cortell. He's not like that, but he he lives in that world where everybody who watches MSNBC and Jake Tapper, they're just all, that's the truth. That's the reality. There's delusional. Uh, there are people in our circles who are just as delusional. And if we don't hold them accountable and if they don't ever face consequences for saying whatever they want, people can get hurt by that. So you've got to hold international international organizations accountable. You've got to hold politicians like Donald Trump and uh, what's her face Whitaker up in Michigan accountable. You've got to hold media figures accountable. You've got to hold yourself accountable. And there has to be consequences for what you say, what you do and how you act. And the more we try to build a society that just protects everybody from consequences, the worst things are going to get like we're experiencing Harry. Well, um, yeah, in the comment section, calling a dear leader status. Well, yeah, he's dissing um, our great, uh, true leader, uh, Ron Paul. Um, how dare you diss our uh, crazy uncle, uh, Ron Paul? <laughs> 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 but it seems like all those years of being called the crazy uncle, he finally be, have become the crazy homeschool uncle. I, I'm sure Ron Paul is a very nice man. Yeah. But I think that Ron Paul has a, as as Reinhold has pointed out a lot of times, he has he has surrounded himself with people that don't have his best interests or society's best interest at heart. And I think Daniel McAdams is one of those people who, you know, it's really weird when Abby Martin, who's paid by Maduro to go out into the American press and publish pro Maduro material. All of a sudden, Daniel McAdams starts saying the same stuff as Abby Martin does on Joe Rogan or some or, or on RT like. Okay, well, that's sort of weird. Like, I know we're all against uh, socialists, but like, we don't, we're all against American intervention, I mean, but that doesn't mean that we're pro socialists that just destroyed their economy. But, you know, and so Daniel McAdams and the people that are kind of using Ron Paul and his name and his platform right now, I think are, are bad actors in a lot of ways. And I think that he's discrediting his own reputation. And Reinhold, that's something that has happened in the past before, as we're all very aware of. It has happened a time or two before, yes, uh, with with that specific uh, individual. So, um, I don't know if you want me to go down the Ron Paul path. If you no, let me, know, I don't, I don't want to be up on that. Jeff, Jeff is right. He the, he used a clickbait headline. Uh, yeah. He called it. He he said, "Don't worry about it. It's it's they're just going to use it to scare you." And my thing about it, once I kind of figured out what was going on, was like, "All right." 
they cry wolf a lot. And Ron Paul was not wrong about that. But sometimes there's a wolf and there there is something to be concerned about. And so I don't know if I, I want to go down the beat up Ron Paul path. I just want to put that out there because I think it's, it's an example of where as libertarians, we have to police our own movement and say to like, I made a decision on our Instagram instead of getting pissed off uh, about all the dumb comments on our Instagram, I realized all those kids are like 14 years old. They're literally like in high school and they don't know anything. And so if I can start educating them, like, hey, the reason that there was a, a test run uh, of a coronavirus pandemic weeks before there was an actual pandemic, Brian, was because they were running a standard test that gets run all the time. And this is how governments do that kind of, that, that they do those sort of things all the time. Yep, they do. And that's the thing. I mean, you always see the, the ads are out in the newspapers or something like that. We need people to come down to be body, to, to fill bodies. So it's a good thing that they test and it's a good thing that they war, essentially war game it. Um, but the reality is just, as I said, you can war game or every situation until that first shot whizzes over your head. And then you realize that the plan's going straight to crap. So best thing you can do is try to get as, as much information as possible, get the right people in place. And hopefully you've done enough training to get it, get it taken care of quickly. I think we're seeing in a lot of States and eh, not as much, but it, it's hard to do when you don't know a lot of variables, especially about this virus. This virus behaves very differently than what you would see with the normal cold and flu and having anywhere from 30 to 70% walking around people walking around completely asymptomatic. Imagine if you had 30 to 70 percent of your invaders have been living in the U.S. for the past 20 years. And all of a sudden your next door neighbor and all the kids come out with AK, start blazing up the neighborhood. It's that kind of we don't know who's got it, what's going on. So it's it's not a very easy one to diagnose and, and be able to fight against. All right, let's let's answer Dion Curry, my great co-host from the Pat Down, who is a Bernie fan. Uh, and he says, isn't it the role of government to be checking uh, uh, checking for the people? Aren't they the ones that are supposed to impose the consequences? I think that's what he's saying here. What do you guys say to that? Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we try. It, uh, the problem is that we all get stuck in our little fiefdoms and parties thinking this is the only way to do something. You know, hey, I, I, I believe I'm, you know, I'm voting for Biden. Trump, whoever, because that's the only way that things can get done. And I think we've proven for the past 200 plus years, we can have a multi-party system that kind of gets things done. But a lot of times it's better when they don't get things done, because as we find out, government tends to really suck at it. Right. And yeah, they I mean, do dangerous oh, things. With, oh. Go ahead, Harry. No, you ahead, Harry. I was talking later. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just saying, like, uh, they do dangerous things when they do check people, when they do check people, like they come up with dangerous ideas, the idea of they're wanting to what uh, find out people who and mark people who have either has been has the virus, has not had the virus. They like to coordinate people off. They do dangerous, harmful things like shutting, shutting things down unintentionally with no plan and no how idea of how, you know, the economy or anything works. Like and dubbing things "quote unquote" essentials, and it's just like you know what we're going to limit and shut it down. They do dangerous checking when they check. You know, it's easier when businesses say like, "Hey, you know what? We're going to do it ourselves. We're going to put mask here. We're going to limit, and we're going to move our factories. We're going to do the way." It's easier for us to do our things like that instead of you shutting everything down so it's hard to get any type of supplies, and unless someone dubs or sees this thing as, um, you know, essential. So, yeah. Reinhold, isn't the role of government to check up on people and bring about consequences? So, the role, of, the only thing that government can do that no other organization of people can do um, is they have the legal use of the of force against the citizenry, right? So, anything that the government does that we don't have a, a non government agency doing, anything that that government does is backed by that. Um, explicit threat or real use of force, right? So all these things that said government can do this and government can do that, that any organization can do those things, right? So you can, you can have an organization, a non-government organization, nonprofit um, that handles nothing but 
pandemics, right? So you could have a pandemic organization um, built from the ground up that is non-political, that looks just at the science, just looks at recommendations that should put in plans in place for this is what we recommend to do. And then um, they can implement that, but they can't enforce anything. So that's what government comes in and government can say, okay, here's a law. We're going to enforce that law because we have the rights. We have the power to do that. We can actually come to your home, put a gun to your head and make you do it or take you to jail or shoot you. Right. So why do we want that power to come to your home and shoot you in everybody's in, in everybody's business for everything that exists? Why do we want that used in all of those circumstances? If it's going to be used, if it's going to exist, it should be limited to those things that are for protecting people from from one another. Right. So not not protecting you from yourself. That's your decision on how you live your life. It's protecting someone from harming you, someone trying to to kill you, someone trying to um, rape you, someone trying to steal from you, that sort of thing. Something that's going to harm you. Um, that's the only real legitimate use of that force. I see it. But um, some people say that we shouldn't even have that, that we should have, you know, uh, just kind of ways to deal with things. And there's there's whole systems for that that goes. But that's really the only thing when when people say the government power to do something, that's the government power is to put a gun to your head and force you to do something. Sorry, I had to cough. Feel free to comment more, Dion. So, and the, the force is the main thing that like without cops, then politicians are just people with bad opinions. Like the, the, the reason that you start to see the, the, the deterioration between communities and police officers at every level in every community, especially right now, as they're pulling people off of buses because they're not wearing a mask, it's because they have the the they have force behind them. And so the f the force becomes the real issue. And so people love to use government to force people to live the way that they want them to live because then that becomes an easier way to handle things than persuading people of something. But the, the cost is that if you had persuaded more people that they should stay inside because it benefits them, then more people would continue to do the right thing because they believe in it. Once you start forcing people, people take issue with the force. They're taking issue with the government action that is being taken as opposed to having a conversation about public health, which is really the conversation that we should be having. Uh, because people start to become concerned with the force that is going to be used against them. The, the other thing about it is that it becomes easy to it becomes easier for for the wealthy and and moneyed interests to come in and start to buy off politicians to avoid consequences. And so government is supposed to be the thing that protects people from bad decisions and is supposed to be the thing that brings about consequences for bad actors. But oftentimes things become worse because the bad actors have been able to take control of the government by buying politicians and incentivizing the politicians with campaign contributions, personal gifts, and, uh, and corruption becomes a serious problem in a system where force grows and the consequences for those bad actors starts to lessen. So you 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 end up with a system where there are less consequences for the people that need consequences and there are more consequences for people to behave in the way that those bad actors would like them to behave and so government in theory is supposed to be the thing that brings about consequences for the people that need to be checked in practice the problem is that it often it, it keeps those people it shields them from being uh, prosecuted. Now, that's not always the case. For instance, in in Ohio right now, uh, before we started the show, we got word that um, the there's a police department. I think it's the whole state of Ohio is going to hand over the list of the state database of everybody that has tested positive for COVID to first responders and police officers. And so, if if you're going out on, now, in theory. Right. That sounds like a great idea. Like you're a police officer, you're showing up to a house, you should be informed that there's a COVID person. Right. 
but in practice, there are serious problems with that database being out in the public. Uh, what what are the what are the it's the slippery slope argument? Like, what are the steps that could happen if that thing that seems like a good idea goes into effect? What are the bad ideas that can come from that? Right. So, do you, do you start to create a database where people are treated differently, or do people who need help? not have a cop show up because they have somebody positive in their household? Do you have people who don't go and get tested for COVID because they don't want the risk of a cop not showing up? So you you have serious problems with that, right? So you can then sue that particular state jurisdiction. You can sue the president. You can sue anybody you want. If you really want it, if you're really ballsy, let's just be honest. If, uh, a lot of these people who like, hey, we're all concerned about this, right? Well, then open your business. And when they come to shut you down, file a lawsuit. Because then you can then take that to the Supreme Court of Indiana or the Supreme Court of the United States at the end of the line and have your rights protected. If you think that the government is acting uh, in a way that needs to be checked, then you have the ability to do that in the judicial system. So uh, that th that's another uh, way that the government does actually work in that through the judicial branch. So Dion says, so the business class enables the government through lobbying to avoid the consequences for which government is supposed to hold them accountable. The problem then in turn is the people who support the business that skirts justice. Yeah, yeah. Th that that's that's also part of it. I mean, that's that's part of the problem with crony capitalism, right? That, that's part of it, but there's also another thing that I think is missing there is that we have the government the power centralized the way it is. We have the, the government functioning the way it is because that's what the people want. Yeah. The majority of people want this. Now they may say they don't want it. They may complain about certain aspects, but when it comes down, push to shove, we're voting in people who have time and time again, centralized that power over us and given that power to the corporation. When you centralize power, the people who want that power are going to go get it. Now, a lot of people who are are thinking that they're for fighting for the working man or the or the common person, they are uh, wanting that power centralized so that they could grab that power and use it to defend those people. But the problem is, is when you centralize that power, you're not the only one fighting for control over that uh, power. You're you're it's put on the market, as it were, and businesses are going to fight for it, too. And everybody's going to fight for it. So the only way to prevent that from being used in the wrong way is not to just be, you know, more loud or more or vote harder or whatever. It's to decentralize that power, to make that power, um, if it's going to be used, make that power being down uh, to the lower level, right? So uh, to the local level, so that you have a little bit more control over everything. So you can, you know, your neighbors, you know, your, your, your uh, society locally and your little culture locally, and you can get the type of government that you really need there without having to fight against multi corporations or large organizations of uh, nonprofit organizations like, uh, I don't know, the Sierra Club or something like that, who are trying to, to uh, lobby the government for their own, for their own power control of that. It, the other thing you run into with the large government is that there's no responsibility. Well, it's a law that came from Washington and it's come down here. Look at unemployment in Indiana. You know, they came out with, oh, oh hey, we're going to give everybody 600 bucks extra each month. And then it takes them two weeks to figure out, you know, what the heck the law really means and how to apply the systems and everything like that. And how many times have we walked into, you know, a large business corporation and it's like they don't really give a crap about us because they don't have any power usually at the front lines, which is where they're dealing with stuff. So it's a it's a perfect, honestly, it's a perfect situation. If you want to be powerful and stuff, get up there and then put a bunch of underlings in front of you to go, well, I can't do anything because unfortunately this law or this process or you didn't fill out the 87 pages of documentation that I need in order to be able to serve you. Uh, the government loves that because then that a prevents them from having to pay things or do anything, but, um, it shields them from any sort of responsibility. And then we look at real responsibility, like police brutality, things like that. And we get qualified immunity. So all of a sudden now we've got a group that sits there and goes, I can't do anything because I don't have the power. 
inside the government. And you have another group that says, yeah, I have all the power, but you can't do anything about it. I mean, yeah, they, or, give, or they give this Harry. Go ahead. I was going to say, or they give themselves a permit to do it, so they protect themselves <laughs> from the pitch of the pitchforks and the the, the torches from the um the, the public. So you know, you it's like, don't worry, I may have pub, pu- polluted your water supply, but it's okay. I had a permit from the EPA. Thank you very much. You know, they protect themselves from everything else. You know, like, or they'll just do something that's completely awful, gets everything, or government will just do it on their own from uh, fake Flint, Michigan. But Michigan, they were told that they, you know, doing this, going from this river water without fixing the pipes, you will get lead water in the pipes. And they did it anyways, you know, and then started dealing with the consequences after they started hiding the fact. It's they sh- and yet put up shielding and protection. So, you know, their mistakes, they, uh, they they couldn't get sued. This is just government on government. It's not even like a private industry. They did yeah. it for, the, for themselves. Which is also another function of what kind of answering Dion's question. Again, you know, the problem then in turn is the people who support that business that skirts justice. Well, the, the reality is that in a crony capitalist system in which we exist, the ability for a company to crowd out competition is much easier and they can create a monopolistic position and so that's partially why facebook and twitter and these major tech companies they want regulation because then that solidifies their position it's why there are four airlines there are four major airlines because it's so well regulated that Mm -hmm. well now we've got to get bail these people out because there's only four of them left And, and so the the reality is that it when you when you when you have central planners mess the market system up and create a lack of choice, then people are funneled to those, those same places. So uh, there's less choice. So in a market system, the government, the, the, the bad actors uh, are easier to kill because there's more competition. And people who want to choose ethical products have more of a pro- – and so, so like in the green movement, for instance – Marketing that you're an ethical choice in terms of uh, sustainability has become uh, a, a way to market to get people to buy your product. You see non, you see toxic products putting like an old style label on the front of their soap dispenser, and you go, "Oh, that must be no, oh, this organic food just must be super healthy for me." It's like no, not necessarily. So you you actually end up making the uh, you pervert the system so you have less choice. So people who want to make the right choice have less choices. So now you've got four airlines and none of them are good. And, you know, then what are you going to do? Fly frontier? I mean, I think we know how that turns out. Dion. Well, I mean, look, look at what the government did to Uber and, and Lyft, right? So they just, it's competition against government stuff. So what I was going to say is that the problem you have is with this idea that you want the government to regulate things or be in, be look for uh, bad bad uses of uh, private industry. Private industry is doing something wrong, so the government comes in and tells them, "Hey, you're doing this wrong." Is that we've given so much work to the government to do that's now them having to regulate themselves, and that's never going to work very well. So, if you want the government to be in that role, the government come in and say, "Okay, we notice that you're doing this wrong." Um, and we're going to do something about it. And you need to take all the pow- other power away that you've given government to have control over so that they can have a, a more of a watchdog function than uh, an implementation function. Like you put government in charge of all the health care, then who's watching them to do the health care right? Right. There's no there's no higher authority for them to go to, to, to look down on them and say, you're doing this wrong. You're messing this up. You're violating this person's rights. Um, they're the ones doing it. So they're not going to, they're not going to check themselves. So as we give more and more of this stuff to the government, you actually end up getting less and less actual oversight over anything. Yeah. We love the question. We think uh, we always love the, the challenges in the comments and I appreciate that Dion and, and, you know, the, the the reality is that it always leads back. Like if you want to implement consequences and you want c- to create good incentives, it always leads back to personal choice. And that's what we're always saying on this show is that it's about what where you choose to put your attention in terms of where you put your podcast. It, it's uh, it's about where you spend your money. That stuff matters. That that stuff 
is where things flow. Harry, did you have something you want to add to this? Yeah. Well, yeah, because the competition, that type of competition tells people to like to skirt different things. Like GM, the big three auto manufacturers who basically pushed out everyone else using the government, you know, it's like, well, electric cars not pa- possible. No one really wants it. But Tesla has shown that no, people actually want it. If you don't make them boring, you make them actually function. Even though I do give Tesla crap. You know, people want these cars, you know, and only idiots buy like what Chrysler 200s, right? You know, um, I no longer drive. a. Did, have I not told you about a new car? Oh, no, no. You didn't tell me you got a new car. I haven't told you I got a new car. No, I drive a Chevy Malibu, sir. Ooh. Wow. You went from bad transmission to yeah. head gasket problems. Yep. Or or are you going to start doing the cop wannabe thing? Put the red and blue hats in the back or something? (laughs) Fuck you guys. All right, moving on. Before before we go, too, remember, this isn't the first time either that that's been a case. I I remember in the 70s when the same thing was happening with the fuel shortage and the American auto workers were putting out these big gas guzzling cars because that's what they thought the people wanted. And these Japanese imports started coming in who were smaller, used, uh, had better gas mileage, and people started buying them up. So that's how we got. So then we had to have a bailout of GM. We had to have a bailout, you know, Lee Iacocca back in the day. Um, that's kind of how this whole thing got started because we protected those companies from bad actions and mm-hmm. bad decisions against competition because we didn't like where the source of the competition was coming from. And they ended up continuing to do the wrong things and, and forcing out competition and getting more and more government involved into the auto industry. And that's where all that started coming from. And then we got the, like the ugly, like what Dodge dynasty. K cars. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh God. <laughs> Mercury. Man. Now the one thing, the cool thing with the Dodge dynasty, right. And welcome to car talk is that the people, the guys who designed the slant six motor, right. Designed mm-hmm. the four AGE motor that's in the Dodge dynasty. Right. Mm-hmm. Which got put into Mitsubishi Galant, right? Which uh, AMG design uh, started tuning the thing for turbos. Mitsubishi picked it up, and that's how it got an Evo. Okay, I have a Mevo camera. No, no Evo, Evo, oh. the Mitsubishi <laughs> Evolution. Yeah, there are like there are like fourteen listeners right now going. Oh, <laughs> he nailed that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also the same motor that's in the Eclipse. That's in the same the on the, the neon the SRT4, mm-hmm. and it was going to put into the uh, Mini Cooper, but BMW took that and went for that different motor, which is what, another reason why it has issues because they didn't go with that one. One because that motor did have a lot of head gasket issues because of the aluminum head cast iron block, but the cast iron block could take a lot of boost. Yeah, uh, and we'll finish up with Dion. Dion says that res- that responsibility is of the people to check the government. We aren't doing our jobs, and we are complaining about the government not doing theirs. It's our fault at the end of the day. Money makes people weak to moral standards, and and on that we agree. I think there is, uh, it's the responsibility of every person to evaluate everything and and judge their choices. Uh, And the more information, the better, right? The more that you read, the more that you learn about things, the more documentaries that are put out. Like I am, I am non-discriminatory when it comes to sources as we'll, as we'll see in a moment, because Reinhold is beside himself that we're going to play a Tucker Carlson clip. Mm. And I'm not, I'm not totally uh, in disagreement, but he sums it. uh, He sums up what's happening in Michigan in a great way. Um, and uh, I want to, it's just easier to let him tell it what, what's happening. Um, but that's the, the reality. I think you have to, you know, part of what we do on the Pat Down podcast with Dion and I, like, I don't know anything about black culture. Like, I am, I mean, Harry, am I the whitest person you know? Uh, second, second whitest. Actually, know someone whiter. Who? This guy, he drinks unsweet tea. Is it Reinhold? <laughs> no, I don't drink tea. I do. I do prefer sweet tea. Yeah, yeah, um, drinks unsweet tea. Uh, but that's, that's the great part about it is you have think to. Think seltzer water is too spicy. <laughs> no. uh, so you have to put seasoning in your seltzer water. If you don't put pepper in your ginger ale, I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, but the the reality is you have to like you have to be. It's exhausting. Being part of this society or a free society or any society, like two ep- two or three episodes ago, Levy goes, that's a lot of work. And I go, I know, but like government 
is a responsibility. Like in a free society, purchase power is a responsibility. Where you spend your dollars now in a, a crony capitalist system is a responsibility. Like these are, it's all about information and uh, where that goes. So, um, yeah. Where you point the guns at, at whose head you point the guns at. That's exactly right. responsibility. Yeah. Yep. Right. But it's not like uh, we got life, it. liberty, and the demand to watch meet the press. You know, we right. didn't want this gigantic government state to force me to have to sit down and read the news every freaking day to understand like these interworkings of these bureaucracies and these government agencies that I have, do not know, never have met, and never went went there. I don't want them. They they're there interrupting in my life. I, and I'm going to, I don't want to investigate and be curious and go after the things that I want in my daily life. I don't, it's the other bit, the mysterious that will not give me information. That is what I dislike, you know? So Donald Trump's comments were egregious and he doesn't have the right to do, the, the president really doesn't have nearly as much power as we like to project. It's just like, we have so few things. Um, <laughs> wall in general is a bunch of status for these opinions being thrown out. Calabar says, uh, the, <laughs> he's talking about sweet tea, I think. Oh, the, 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 uh, the reality is that the president has as little power. It's, he's probably one of the more weaker positions in the entire uh, system than you'd think. Like your, your governor, as you can see, has a lot more power over you, but because we have so few things in common as a country anymore, we all focus on that one person, that one thing we've perverted really what the job is supposed to be, which again is our own fault and our own lack of education about things. But your governors uh, are really going to start exercising a lot more power. And I think that this is good for the 10th Amendment. Uh, and so uh, Tucker Carlson last night on Fox News, uh, I want you to uh, reg register your uh, complaint right now, Reinhold. It's okay. Uh, actually, okay. So there is something funny going on with Fox News, and you're starting to see it as I think that they are starting to pull back and become more centrist. Yeah. Where all of that used to be at Fox News is starting to go is to OAN. Mm. And you can tell this because Trump is now dissing Fox News and making sure that the OAN reporter who was told that she wasn't allowed to come into the press briefings anymore still was able to come in and was yeah. overruled. I have a friend who uh, is, is an expert in the media business, and they say that uh, Fox News is putting all their Tommy Lauren type stuff on the app, on that Fox Nation stuff, and they're trying to move their news product on the main channel more centrist. And if you, you know, so I, I've watched a couple weeks solid of CNN and I was like, you know, let me flip over to the other side and see what they're saying. And Bill Himmer was like the Anderson Cooper of three years ago. Like it was really, it was, it was interesting to see. And Tucker Carlson has been far less crazy than I expected him to be. Uh, and so he had this one piece last night. Now there was one part where he was just like, you know, do, he, he implied that Dr. Fauci said, you know, we, we shouldn't be shaking hands anymore. We should just stop shaking hands. Fauci was giving an opinion and nobody has to listen to it, including the president. We can all ignore Dr. Fauci. He's just a low level bureaucrat in the in the National Institute of Health and has been for 30 years, which is why you've never heard of the man. And so he's not outlawing handshaking as Tucker Carlson was trying. They're not taking that away from you, too, which is sort no, of pretty sure. I'm pretty sure Trump is uh, avoids handshaking at all costs as much as he can, you yeah. know, being a politician, but he's a big germaphobe and I know that he doesn't like that stuff. So yeah, but then a he, lot of people. he talked about governor Whitner at uh, Whitmer, uh, who is the governor of Michigan. And as we've said on the program before, she's angling to be the VP pick and uh, he references that. So let's take a listen to this and uh, hear his case of why there has been massive government overreach in Michigan. So it takes courage and wisdom to see what's happening clearly and serve your people effectively. Most politicians are not capable of that. Here's a case in point. On March 23rd, Gretchen Whitmer, who's the governor of Michigan, announced it was gonna be necessary to lock down her state. And she explained why she was doing it. Here's what she said. Without additional aggressive measures, soon our hospitals will be overwhelmed. And we don't all, we currently don't even have enough beds, masks, gowns, and ventilators. We must work together to bend the curve. We must do more to curtail community spread so our health system has a fighting chance. 
Today, I'm issuing a stay home, stay safe executive order. Okay, so she said, we want to be fair here, what a lot of people were saying last month, which is, we need to slow the transmission of this so our healthcare system doesn't fall apart. As we just told you a moment ago, that's what the model said. Models that already factored in the lockdown. So two weeks later, what's happened? Well, Michigan's healthcare system has not collapsed. Even in Detroit, which as you likely know, has seen one of the worst coronavirus outbreaks anywhere in the nation. Many hospitals in Michigan as of tonight are now discharging more coronavirus patients than they're admitting. In fact, an emergency hospital under construction outside Detroit has slashed its bed count from 1,000 to just 250. Why? The expected number of patients failed to arrive. Now, that's all great news that you would think Governor Whitmer, who's supposed to be looking out for the interests of her own people, would be celebrating on television. She's doing just the opposite. She has moved aggressively to seize even more control of her state and the lives of the people who live there. So she bowled forward. Last week, Whitmer banned all gatherings anywhere for any reason of any size, including in people's private homes, as if she's allowed to do that. If Michigan residents own more than one home, Whitmer has banned them from traveling between them. And outside Detroit, it's very common, especially for working class people, to have a cabin up north. You're not allowed to go there. And then she kept going. Not only did Governor Whitmer close most stores in the state, she banned the few that remained open from selling items that she deemed unnecessary. Big box stores will also have to close areas of the store that are dedicated to things like carpet or flooring, furniture, garden centers, plant nurseries, or paint. If you're not buying food or medicine or other essential items, you should not be going to the store. So where did this come from? How did Governor Whitmer know that paint, buying cans of paint could be deadly? How does not buying cans of paint prevent the spread of the coronavirus? Well, you'll notice we didn't play the whole clip, but if we did, you would have seen that Governor Whitmer didn't bother to explain because she had no clue. Because she didn't talk to anyone who'd studied it before she made the order. She could have consulted Henrik Streeck. Streeck is a German professor who directs the Institute of Virology at the University of Bonn. He's done a lot of research on this, and based on it, he's concluded that actually there's very little risk of spreading the coronavirus while shopping, or actually even from touching surfaces, contrary to what they told you last month. Instead, Streak found almost all the spread of the coronavirus came from, quote, people being closer together over a longer period of time. Now, that's the kind of behavior that maybe a mask might mitigate, the ones they told you not to wear. And by the way, if that's true, then maybe you should think twice before you force people to remain indoors with one another all day, as Governor Whitmer has. Now, Sweden has a slightly larger population than the state of Michigan, and just like Michigan, it's a mix of larger cities and smaller towns. Sweden has never, unlike Governor Whitmer and so many American states, adopted the Chinese model, the authoritarian model, in order to contain coronavirus. Yet so far, Sweden has fewer cases of coronavirus and fewer deaths than the state of Michigan does. Huh. Does the governor of Michigan know this? Does she care? No. That suggests it's about science, but it's not. And you know that by now. It's about power. Governor Whitmer wants to be the vice president. She wants to be chosen by Joe Biden. That's pretty clear. And she's calculated that there is no penalty for petty authoritarianism. In fact, petty authoritarianism might make even mediocre politicians look strong and decisive. That's her bet. She's willing to destroy the people in her state in exchange. And incidentally, when exactly did Governor Whitmer become so deeply concerned about citizens dying and willing to do anything to prevent it? In 2018, Michigan had almost 2,800 deaths from overdose. It had another 1,500 suicides, more than that. Now, unlike coronavirus, every single one of those deaths might have been preventable. As it was, they fell disproportionately on the young and the middle age. And yet, Whitmer didn't shut anything down. She didn't even consider closing pharmacies, dispensing this poison, asking police to conduct random searches to ferret out drugs and dealers. No. Saying something about China, which is sending all this crap into our country. Not a word. As for suicides, if she cared, she could have taken anyone in the state into custody at any time if that person was identified at risk of self-harm. But that wasn't a consideration either. Then again, at the time, Joe Biden didn't need a running mate. And CNN wasn't watching. 
So what do you two or what do you three think of the case that he just made? There were a few fallacies in there that um, he is good at trying to use in order to make his point. But he, I mean, Whitmer's not, you know, she's made some really bad decisions as far as trying to lock this thing down. Like you can't go to, so most people go to the store to buy, you know, goods and services, whatever, they're still going to the mire right now. They're going to pick up the food and everything else. And while they're there, they might want to go pick up something else. You know, this whole, this whole idea of roping off parts of the stores because you're not allowed to sell certain items is just, I don't know. I kind of understand where she thinks she's going with that, but it just doesn't make sense when you know how people actually shop. I just don't think she knows anymore. I don't think she goes and shops anymore, as it were. So it she makes, doesn't get it. But it makes sense if you're protecting the business. You're you're robbing income of a business that's open to protect the income or, you know, it's like people can't go buy paint at a paint store theoretically. Mm -hmm. So why let Walmart have that revenue? Because it's not fair to the paint store in town, but then you're just accelerating the problem because people are going to, they want to buy paint. And so maybe they'll go online and buy paint. And so you're robbing your community money at Walmart. So it's, it's sort of insane thinking and so that's where he does kind of have a point. There are definitely some problems with yeah. uh, several things that he said, and and he's, right. you know, he's fudging as, as one tries to do in a in a in a court case, I guess. Is yeah. Well, the, the Sweden said. thing is is something I hear a lot too, and it's just like the reason right. that Sweden didn't tamp down and have uh, draconic draconian mesh measures is because the people in Sweden self-isolated just like the people in san francisco did before the government even came in that's why san francisco's right. numbers are so low too because everybody said no businesses said stay home everybody stayed home and the community decided to shut down because they understood the risk and they were well informed and they prepared themselves and they did it they didn't need the government to come in and tell them to do this because they were smart enough to do it on their own whereas now we've got states who are just, who are trying we had all these people who are like flaunting it and trying to have covid parties and and just tell the government to get lost that we're going to do what we want to do and those are the ones who have the problems it is sort of weird to go from the conservative pundit that like goes from we should punish china for lying about person-to-person transmission but then they're like there's no evidence that sheltering in place works like yeah, uh, it's, it's funny because he he makes the point himself where he's like well she put out these orders that they were to shelter in place in order to flatten the curve and guess what they didn't get as many people as they thought they were going to get because it worked. Right. Right. He doesn't make that connection. Now she goes on further and shouldn't be doing some of the things she's doing. I get that, but you know, that, up, that's the problem Brian, I have with them. Brian roping off the playground here in my local town to prevent families from going to a playground and playing on a park when the sunlight will probably kill the virus. Like, it, it is a little, it does strike me a little bit of, uh, it, it, it. it's like, we're going to remind you who's in charge. <clears throat> and if you don't obey, we're going to clamp down even further until you get the message that we're in charge and you're not. Yeah, we're going to take, we're going to block off all the basketball hoops. We're going to taser you if you go running out in the park, uh, the one guy chasing the guy in the Italian beach and things like that. Yeah, but the funny thing is this, is that it's pretty much universally panned except for a few group of Karens that uh, are trying to keep everybody home um, because they're convinced that the 5G is creating wormholes for the coronavirus to come into you. So, uh, you know, that that's the, that's the thing is that there's a lot of misinformation out there, but the problem is this, who's supposed to be the arbiter of information? Usually it's been the government. We see how good they, they do. And we see how they get in the way of freaking everything. Yeah, that's a point I made today. Like, if China had been honest about their numbers yeah. and the World Health Organization had reported the the just the absolute facts, is there anybody that would have listened? Like, nobody in this country. I mean, I personally wasn't paying attention to this and didn't think when, it was a big deal. Until when it first came out, we mocked it because we were it. trying to – we didn't – what we were making fun of the name of it, right? Right. And, and did you you saw before we went on the air that Trump has decided to suspend payments to the World Health Organization, right? Yeah, he's he's creating an enemy to get the yeah. heat off of himself. Now, Harry, you actually were sick at one point, 
And we joked about you having coronavirus because we didn't take it seriously. And China telling the truth would not have changed that fact. It wasn't until Joe Rogan did a podcast that I was like, maybe this is a thing. Uh, yeah, uh, that's true. I could have did a better job of telling you, like, you know, this is why I think it's a bad thing. This is what I'm seeing from South Korea. This is what I'm hearing from gamers over there. This is what they're saying, you know? Right. You know, because I was kept telling people, like, hey, this is bad. You should probably get stuff. And you're right. Up until that podcast, everyone looked at me like I was a joke. I kept yeah. telling people, buy your alcohol, buy your food, buy stuff. Just get this. Get this crap. I wish I had bought dumbbells. There's none in the stores. There's none on Amazon. There's no, you can't get dumbbells anywhere. And my, and my back is aching because it's not getting worked out, Harry. Tell you the truth, uh, you're kind of right because I, I usually keep some dumbbells in the back of um, Bun Bun, my Subaru. And someone's like, man, you selling those? No, they're, they're mine. You can have these little tents. No, 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 no. What the big ones? What, is that to keep you from slitting, uh, sliding in the. With the the Subaru bun bun, yeah, yeah, she doesn't need that. I'm, I'm moving, so I just kind of kept those weights in the back there and just, right. just left them there. Some of us here have a city Super house heavy. and a country house. <laughs> you okay. literally do. You have a summer house and a winter house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least I do have those elastic stretch strips. I'll all use those, I guess. But it, it's, it's not the same as Iron Man. Okay, you're, yes, listen, Lisa. You're a lady. You don't know what it's like when you're a man and you just want to just you know, be a man and pump iron. Right, Harry? Yeah. Um, my mother just commented uh, when I, before I could afford uh, real ways, I used to fill up water jugs full of a uh, sand or water and just lift those. Yeah. Uh, as you know. as uh, Maria Biggs Brown says, water bottles filled with sand. Yep. Do you know her? Yeah, uh, it works. Uh, but also uh, you can also toughen up your knuckles by, you know, punching hard in sand. Um, but yeah, I'm glad and glad I still have um, my weights, you know, because after a while, you're right. Yoga is like, okay, I need some, I need some heavy weights, or I need to do something, you know. So another thing, if you can't find heavy weights, well, this probably won't work for Spangle, but uh, you can uh, get wood and just chop wood. But you buy your wood, uh, of course. I don't know if they'll let you buy your wood now. I don't know that you're allowed to leave your house. No, it's it's it is funny, you know the. Uh, on the conspiratorial side, it's gone. You know, the people who said this wasn't real three weeks ago, now the numbers aren't adding up on the thing that they don't think is real. And so, you know, they've kind of shifted over time over on, on what they're talking about. But the people in public health circles that, you know, that are informing policymakers, it's, it's been a shift from we just need to build capacity to get the hospitals ready because the goal is to flatten the curve so that everybody who can live can live. We don't want people to die because they can't get medical intervention. We don't want people stacked up in the, in the lobby and they can't get health care. So we got to flatten that curve and build capacity. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? We've hit that point. And now the argument from those same people like Ezekiel Emanuel in the New York Times is we've got to get to no cases. Well, uh, no, I'm sorry. The, the the Harvard study came out today, in, and I saw in Bloomberg that uh, we're going to have rolling shutdowns for uh, until 2022. You know, they say 18 months, so you'll accept six gladly. And the the shift in messaging has not gone unnoticed by me, and I'm more than willing to do this for a couple months to flatten that curve. But the reality is the public health crisis that we talked about in the in the previous episode of these shutdowns becomes really significant. You start getting a lot of drug, drug overdoses, people relapsing on alcohol and drugs and substances, suicide. You start to, you have the, the public health crisis of people not going and getting cancer treatments or eye surgeries or those elective surgeries that are desperately needed. Uh, you, you can't, you can't continue to keep shut down things down till August. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the food crisis, as you'll hear in our nonprofit episode uh, episodes. The, the reality is that people have to work and the, that people are going to have to make an informed decision about their, their health and then make a decision accordingly. And if businesses want to stay shut, then businesses stay shut. You know, the, the, this is a high, fast spreading disease. Biology is in charge. You know, Brian, you're the one who you mentioned it earlier, Smithfield up in South Dakota. South Dakota is taking flack from the press because, 
She's the only governor that didn't issue a stay-at-home order. Well, Smithfield proves a couple things. Smithfield uh, is it, – it's got like 300 cases. They're a pork processing plant. Yep. And one person showed up to work. There's no testing. There's no temperatures. They're not taking a ton of precautions as it looks – what it looks like and so what happened in those first episodes when we told you don't let people tell you there are no like the government is only responsible for economic shutdowns because the health consequences the health fallout of an unchecked spread of COVID-19 is going to bear a lot of economic consequences which you're seeing at Smithfield you're seeing them have to shut down and now a whole line of food and our food chain of pork production is dominoing down because uh, of unchecked spread within that business. That was always going to happen. Biology was always going to take place. If anybody tells you that it's just the government shutdown's fault, that the economic situation is the way it is, they're lying to you. They're either too ill-informed for you to listen to, or they're intentionally manipulating you, and you need to ask them what would happen if there hadn't been government shutdowns in terms of an economic fallout. Nobody seems on the economic in the economic circles on the right Seems to want to ever address that because they just want to demonize government for uh, their own purposes. But Smithfield also, sh you know, it shows that people are going to do what they want. They are. And that's the great thing about the, a lot of this and a lot of other countries, too, because if there's demand for something, it's going to get fulfilled. And those people are going to work there. I'm pretty sure they, they probably made some sort of calculated risk. I'm not saying, you know, well, it's on them. But I'm sure they said, hey, I want to keep working. And this company has decided to tell me that if I don't show up, I get laid off. So I want to keep my paycheck. Where are the odds of me getting it? Oops, somebody came in and now 300 people are sick or at least tested positive. You know, the, the percentage that are actually sick and going to the hospital is still fuzzy. But the other problem you're running into is that you're also seeing shutdowns and things like Quest Diagnostics, who does lab testing. They just announced today they're furloughing a ton of workers. Why the heck are they furloughing a bunch of lab workers? Oh, wait, all those other procedures that got put on hold aren't being tested. <laughs> so they're literally having to furlough lab workers because of COVID-19, not because there's not demand for COVID-19 testing, but for all the other tests that go on in a normal day that's all been shut down by well, by the government to a point. Yeah, no, I'm not saying that there, I mean, the, the government shutdown has severe economic con consequences. And as go, as Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan shows, it's an uneven, unfair. It, Harry, isn't it amazing that here in Indiana, where the show originates, that all of the people who are essential are the people who have the best lobbyists? lobbyist or people who can get close to the next one and then right. your business can be open just like hmm, hmm i don't like that that liquor store can stay open better make it for online curbside order oh what your small liquor store doesn't have a web presence good thing mine does yeah you know and it's like it was ridiculous i had to sit there and um I'm watching it as the small time liquor store down the street from my house they're having to like you know put your phone number up on the door call this number <laughs> <laughs> so we can ring you up over the phone because I don't have a huge web presence because they're a freaking liquor store, yeah. you know. And it's and it's okay, maybe I, where I'm at now. Now I'm in, you know, this small town. But you know, when I was in the center in Indianapolis, yeah, there's tons of these liquor stores like that. So like I have to do carry out, which is crap, you know, because what it does is the big box chain store that lobby to make sure we don't have cold beer in our freaking grocery stores did this crap, you know? right? Because they've got the web presence, they've got their site on door, so you can do curbside. Which you know, I, one I'm kind of grateful for because, like, before that curbside pickup, I was down to like one can of caviar and and one bottle of Moet, and I'm you know I'm glad that you know at least it was able to pick up a case. Lisa says Michigan hasn't dared to try to close the party stores. What does that mean, like Party City? No. Uh, Is Michigan a major party state, and I don't know it? <laughs> Lake Michigan, yeah. Yeah, it's huge in party. Yeah. And they yeah. just uh, did recreational marijuana too. They finally got it out. Yeah. And and the thing is, this, of course, you know, it comes back down to oh, she's saying party stores, but yeah, the thing about it is, remember the small county I live in. There's about 40, 50 sheriffs, and there's thirty four thousand people that live in this small Indiana county. Right. What percentage of that group is armed? Yeah, you can open your yeah. business tomorrow. You're just a pussy, and you won't. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. 
if if there's well, an and the real fan. the real thing is is that we're not no no cases isn't going to be the solution. What's really really need to happen is good fast testing that's being done as people enter into those places. So if you're going into work at a at a meat packing uh, place, they should be taking your temperature. They should be giving you tests if your temperature is high. I find those people, get them isolated, get them, make sure they have the treatment they need and make sure they're not affecting anybody else. And then you can move on. And if we had done that way, way, way in the beginning, we may not have even had to shut down. And now that we're here, we should be ramping that section part of it up so that when we do pull back the shutdown, we have some sort of plan in place to to handle what's going to happen once we do that. People are, are just arguing about this, you know, well, we should have shut down or we should have shut down. That's besides the point. People are going to stay home anyway. We're uh, A lot of people are going to do just like Sweden did or like San Francisco did. They're going to self-isolate. And until you can have that mechanism in place where anybody who wants to get tested can get tested, which we were promised would happen in the first week of March mm -hmm. um, by President Trump. He said that anybody who wants to get tested can get tested. Well, that's not the case. Um, the if we get them so that there's 15 minute res result, right? So that's, that's one of the other things that are coming out. We've got people who are putting tests together that are uh, not as invasive as the, the swab through the back of the throat, uh, through the nose. It's uh, uh, more, it's more of a saliva test and they can give you a result in 15 minutes. That's what's going to help solve the problem. Cause people who do find out they get it can start getting treatment quick and they can start isolating to keep giving it from anybody else, right? Yeah. Uh, party stores are apparently what they call liquor stores in Michigan. Um, uh, Cal Bear says on Twitch, I don't think most people would have stayed home though. The, I, I disagree. I think that the reality is you've kind of reached the point of, uh, of saturation in terms of the people that you've persuaded. And most people are going to do what they want. I mean, I drove by Bob Evans the other day and it was packed and, you know, those people were standing super close to each other. And it's like, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm kind of thinking I had it a couple of weeks ago. I don't have a test. I don't know for sure, but you know, I don't know if that means I'm immune if I, I don't know for sure. So it's like, I'm keeping my six foot distance when I go to the store, you know? And I mean, and I'm, I'm like as anti shutdown as anybody. So I'm not, you know, my behavior going to the store today was, it felt like I was doing something wrong. Like that, that feeling is not going to come back and it has nothing to do with a government shutdown. People are not going to places because of their own personal self-interest and their own interest in their family and their, their health. It has very little to do with government. Like will people make the, you know, it, part of the issue is it's kind of like car accidents. Like there's going to be a, a calculated risk for people, you know? And so you, you go, all right, I could drive this car. And I understand that driving this car in this way at this speed increases my chances of getting hurt. Uh, then people are going to make that decision. And I think they are factoring. And, and why do people not go 120 miles an hour? Like I want to. Because, uh, I, because of stupid people on the roads and Indiana roads aren't flat. You know, they've got potholes in it. Not, not right. Not only my own safety, but I don't want to be responsible for hurting another person. You don't stop at a stop sign because the government tells you to stop at a stop sign. You stop at a stop sign because it's the best thing for your rational self-interest. It's the best thing for other people. You don't want to hurt other people. And empathy generally is the best way. Uh, you know, mixed in with a little shame sometimes like uh, where, you know, now we've got these people who have the ability to call the 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 police because they're not acting the way that I want. And so they want to shame. And so it increases the amount of shame. Uh, but I, I tend to think that we're not acting a lot different right now than if government didn't exist. Like this is one of those times where government creates a lot of incentives and, uh, and bad consequences or good consequences or whatever. This is one of those times where biological consequences are at the forefront of everybody's decision. You know, will I go get a haircut if we open up next week? I will go get a haircut next week because the reality is walking into a barber shop where there may be 10 people uh, the reality is someone in there may have it. I might have it. And then I need to make the decision to go, okay, I need to avoid doing certain things like seeing at-risk individuals for the next week or two. 
I need to make sure that uh, I, I don't get too close to people. And there's also a lot of science out there, as Carlson kind of referenced, that it's it's about the viral load that you take. If you were if you were sleeping in a bed next to somebody with it, or if you were in an ICU taking care of COVID patients, that's a much heavier viral load that you're taking in, you know. Or if you're getting sneezed on and the virus is coming from the the droplets and getting into your mucous membranes, that's a problem, right? That's where wearing a mask can help uh, mitigate a lot of this. But if you're walking around a store, the viral load that you're taking if you walk into a cloud of virus is very minimal. And if you're wearing a mask, it may help minimize some of that. So we've gone from let's all stay six feet apart from each other to let's not go out in public and ever see anyone. And if you go out with your kids to a park and walk around, you're literally murdering people. And so it's just gone a little too far. And we're not the, the people who are who are going we need to stand up for science and do what's right for science have gone past the science and they're no longer kind of grabbing onto what's going on because now it's, it's social, it, it, it's virtue signaling. You're wearing your, your flashy comment of stay at home. God damn it. Why aren't you people staying home? That's fashion. You're just wearing fashion to show the other people that you're in down for the cause. And let's all join up in the same tribe. Like you're not, if you're yelling at people for going for a run in their neighborhood, as happened to my sister, uh, they went for a walk as a family and some neighbors started screaming at them that they're trying to kill people. That person is irrationally afraid and that person is not informed and that person is as dumb and as harmful to society as the person who is wandering around outside kissing people for no reason, Brian. And and they instigate that, right? So right. they instigate the other side of, of the of the equation to then not believe in the science and try to find the the real experts on the on the hidden areas, right? So it it creates that divide that we see in politics all the time. But this is just doing it in healthcare now in the health industry because uh, people are are just going off the deep end on which either side of the situation that they're on, which reinforces the other side to keep doing the same thing. And, and they're going to keep pushing the fringes on it. And unfortunately, you can just put up anything in social media. It's going to get if it. If you've got an audience, like we talked about with Ron Paul, if you've got an audience that that wants your information, they're going to look for it. They're going to get it from you. But the reality is that a lot of this is also about self-control because we really don't have any control over this virus. I mean, you, any one of us could have got it in the last five days, start being symptomatic tomorrow. And we'll go through, all right, you know, there, there's no control over that. And that scares the hell out of people. So mm -hmm. having that information gives them a little bit more control. My way is putting up a spreadsheet that's tracking numbers now that I can just go to a website, hit refresh, and all the data is there. But I'm still doing it this way because I I'm, I like it. <laughs> so I'm doing a ton of podcasts because it gives me something to do. You know, it, it, it is. It's, it's a thing that I can control. I can, I have literally like, probably seven podcasts lined up tomorrow <laughs> like uh you know it, it, nonprofit interviews all kinds of pat downs it's just too much but you know it keeps me busy right and, mm -hmm. and i think that's the thing that we talked about in, in the episode before this with lex where we're all dealing with grief we're all dealing with it in our own ways we all don't want this to be real it all sucks for everybody and it sucks for everybody in different ways and there is no suckage anywhere like it, you know, personally, I'm OK, but people I love are not. And that means it sucks. You know, Harry, I mean, that's just the reality of it. It's and so everybody deals with it in their own way. Some just want to pretend that it's not real. Others want to pretend that they can if they can control those around them hard enough, they can make the virus not affect them or go away. And it just it sucks when you're not in control. Well, the small town I'm in right now, they completely acted. A lot of them have acted like there is no virus. The moment right. you come into this little like small town, it's just like there are people out playing, hanging around. I see. Uh, oh, I think only like my neighbors who really like. Uh, but like, she's a nurse, so she you know, like they're 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 doing her thing. Everyone else, I'm just trying to move in. Everyone was like, "Hey, what's up? Back off, back up, back up. Go over there. Don't come here." <laughs> 
<laughs> because I don't know, you know, I don't know if I have it, and I don't want to be the first thing that they meet me in this small town. Is like, hey, remember that black guy moved down down the street and coughed on everyone? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and he took out all these older people, and then he moved his black family in. It was awful. It was terrible. <laughs> yeah, and I think Reinhold, the uncertainty of when it ends is why people are so eager to let's open the economy. Let's open the economy. We gotta, we gotta end this. If we can just get back to normal, if we can get in, end the shutdown, then that means the virus will have not defeated us. Well, it, that's fuzzy thinking because it's not going to go back to normal. Um, th- th- there's going to be a new normal that people don't realize. This, I guess. Uh, they think they're going to open up all the stores and everybody's just going to go flooding back in and it's going to be a big heyday and the economy is going to roar back to life. And that's not kind of it's not what's going to happen because this isn't the first time that we've been through this sort of thing. And what you find is that people will change their behaviors because they're now aware of the dangers that are there. And and this whole idea of, of personal space that we used to have that was kind of going away for a long time. And people were getting into everybody's personal space. Uh, now that's extended out to a six foot radius, uh, and people are going to start trying to respect that as much as they can. For I don't a, know that that ever quite a while. Like, do you? I don't think that ever yeah. goes back. I think like the mask wearing thing that is a permanent fixture in Asian countries. That's here. The non shaking hands, uh, you know, Fauci. I'm all for not shaking your hand. I don't want to touch your dirty skin. <laughs> Like, get away from me. I think so. I think that, and I have a big personal wide space. Like, I want personal space. I think here's what I'm thinking, Reinhold. I want to start a campaign for more leg room. Hear me out on this. We're all a little cramped right now. And I think that if we just start a campaign where we we just need more leg room, and if we take that to never mind, (laughs) I tried that joke in the, in the, facebook group the other day nobody got it or maybe they thought it was inappropriate and i shouldn't have said it <laughs> but yeah that's it. so i mean yeah we, they're not going talking, back to their old behaviors yeah. is what you're saying yeah, yeah we've been talking about the 1918 flu right so i mean how much similarity in the reactions and how people went through that process and how they came out the other side and how kind of slow it was the economy actually did better than people thought it was going to because of certain mechanisms. But the great thing about this, if there is a great thing is that a lot of businesses are starting to realize they can change their business model and they can make money uh, in a way differently than like they used to. So we're seeing different opportunities and different uh, possibilities popping up for that, which is a good thing, but um, we're still going to see this return. Like who's going to go back to a movie theater? Uh, in the next six months, right? Nobody's going to be going back to the movie theaters. I think most of them know that they're probably going to close down. If, if you test um, positive, you might. Oh yeah, you well, don't if you can get tested. No. <laughs> yeah. So, so as people start to, I, I think that we are going to go back to it because we went through the 1918 thing, and then by the the Roaring Twenties, which was the economy kind of roaring back to life, eventually after all of that. People were going back to doing the same things they were doing before. So people, and then the next generation is going to not realize it's just like this generation didn't really take pandemic seriously because they hadn't lived through one before. So, you know, that refresh of, of pulling back and changing society is going to happen, but it's going to slowly morph again and go back to similar, similar ways as it was before. Maybe not exactly, but it's going to be, it's going to be different. Society changes. Uh, yeah. based off what it experiences and it's always changing and it's never going to be the same as it was it's not norman rockwell 1950s isn't coming back anytime soon so. we're different now right so yeah. it's kind of like that and the technology that's going to come out because of this i mean three of us work in the tech sector can you imagine now all the security cameras are suddenly going to be loaded with ir to be able to detect temperatures as you walk into the room yep and it's going to flag happening, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're already checking people with the little thermometers, but now imagine how I can go ahead and sell you security system. They'll tell you the temperature of everybody walking in, their history of temperature and everything else. All of that's going to come into play. And that's going to be, there's going to be a lot of innovation, which has been actually the scary thing is this. We've seen more innovation from this virus in the medical community in the past two months than we've seen in the past two years. And I'll probably even go five years because they, the FDA has loosened restrictions. Before we tried to do telemedicine, you had to go through a HIPAA compliant pro- protocol 
that was just almost impossible to adhere to. Nobody could get it. Or if they did, it was only the big hospital chains. And surprisingly, they didn't want to share it. The FDA loosened the regulations. And now they just basically say, try not to use TikTok when you're talking to patients. <laughs> <laughs> and the other good thing, too, is that wearing masks really defeats facial recognition very well. Mm -hmm. Yes, it well, does. That and good sunglasses. You can learn a lot from the people of Hong Kong. So, Harry, I'm thinking of my new outfit is going to be a mask, but then I'm going to wear Ray-Ban sunglasses, maybe some aviators, and then a gray hoodie and just kind of, you know, keep it just get a full hoodie. Right. Yeah, kind of like that. Maybe I'll even just lose the mask and I'll grow a mustache, too. What about that? You're, you're close to have you're close to having to do that anyway, because you're becoming so popular. No. Um, that you know you can't just go outside anymore without getting mobbed, right? It's so you don't hard. want to have that happen. It's so hard going out. They go, look, yeah. that's the guy from McDuffin memes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the guy that Rum Kendall hates. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Rob. Poor Rob, man. His audience is so dumb. <laughs> I love Rob. He's such a good dude. Oh, it was a fun day today. Oh, his audience is just... What did you guys do to Rob? Oh, okay, all right. After show. Rob, no, no, Rob didn't have problems. He, Rob posted something, Chris made a comment on it, and then a bunch of the dumbest people I've talked to in weeks decided they wanted to have a say. So, and I spent an hour and a half just like, <laughs> just kind like of fun. it was a fun time. So Rob posts this thing that, uh, you know, would you keep taking your car to a mechanic who for three months repeatedly wrongly diagnoses the problem, never repairs it properly, takes consulting advice from people who have been repeatedly wrong about your problem and changes their mind on a weekly basis on whether or not the car is safe to drive. So I, I said, thank you for making the case that failed politician Donald Trump should not be reelected. <laughs> <laughs> this has probably 70 different comments. It's more than 70. It's over 100 because I'm probably 40 of those. I thought you were going to say, like, well, people kept buying Mercedes Benz and they had that brake issue last year and people kept buying Mercedes Benz. But this, oh, this person, Don, Don writes, Dennis Beatty, I said good day. <laughs> <laughs> this annoyed everyone. Oh, uh, all right. Well, we need to start wrapping up. Let me first uh, say that I should have done this early on, but I was just so like in the in the zone that I, I didn't get to it. But I want to thank all of our patrons. Thank you all so much for being patrons. Thank you to our one hundred dollar month patrons like Reinhold, Matthew Durbin, Christy Avery, Jeff Bennett, Jason Doolittle, Ed Brehob, Craig DaCosta, and Anthony Meyer. Uh, final words from everybody. Uh, let's go with uh, Reinhold. Uh, one thing I did want to do is, like, as I, I did promise that I was going to do it uh, when we were talking earlier, is that to bring up the point that you were making about uh, focusing on Donald Trump now that he's made this this big, huge blunder, is that we were seeing this before and we were trying to warn people about this before. And the reason we were doing that was to get attention so that maybe we could stop this from happening at a time when it was so important, right? So when those non-important things happen, but you're seeing the trend, you're seeing what the person is capable of and what he will do, uh, that's the time to act, not after he's already destroyed the economy and uh, didn't act soon enough and that sort of, you know, all, all of that, and now he's trying to take, you know, say he has this ultimate authority. Yes, yes, you're right. Donald Trump is an authoritarian ass. Brian was right about hydrocloxacorn and Quinn, and uh, Harry was right about coronavirus. All right, you're all very smart. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that that's, that's the reason why people like me are being so annoying for the past year. I mean, I remember I was defending Trump for his first year in office. So um, I switched at the, as the Mueller report came out and realized that he had, you know, obstructed justice and saw the pattern of behavior that he was going through over this thing that he says he wasn't guilty of, which was great. You, they couldn't find any proof of it, but if you weren't guilty of it, then you were fighting it so hard in such bad, illegal ways that it just told me about what the type of person you were. And that's when I started sounding the alarm against them. And that's, I just, I just wanted to make the case of why some of us are doing that uh, when it wasn't about things that weren't necessarily as critical as, as uh, a pandemic is Brian. You know, the funny thing is this, I think if, if this, this virus happens four years earlier and Obama's president, 
What, what's going to be different about it? Well, we're going to get probably a lot more comfort from, you know, him talking and people are going to be, you know, very much, oh, he, he knows what's going on. He'll have smart people on there. But I think we'll also be looking at the CDC going, well, you know, we're going to start doing some guideline testing and the NIH and the FDA will go, well, we'll start opening doors on things like that. And, and I mean, yeah, Trump is, you know, obviously a blowhard and, and an idiot in a lot of different ways. But the thing is, he also does those things that kind of just jar things loose. I mean, it, frankly, watching him being the Zaphod people box uh, of freaking <laughs> government <laughs> is, frankly, the best thing you can hope for is for hopefully everyone goes, yeah, you know, we don't want to give this one person this much freaking power. We want to put up a clown that we can say, hey, they're kind of there to, to dance and enjoy, you know, to entertain you. And then finally, we can go ahead and maybe get some real people behind the scenes. And Mike Pence, not real, but anyway, you know what I mean? We all do that with that. Yeah, Mike, Mike Pence, he was asked about uh, <laughs> comments and he said, no, I agree wholeheartedly with the president. He has all the power in the world. Uh, yeah, I do think that there is an argument to be made that Donald Trump in his administration acts the way that most administrations act. It's just that there's such intensity in terms of covering him mm -hmm. that people see things and they go, this isn't right. And so they may be more aware in the future, but, but Reinhold's certainly right in that he is, uh, his, his tendencies uh, for authoritarianism are there. Oh, yeah. you no, know, I mean the, just, He's really shown it hardcore in the last two months and using this in a way that is just like, how do you not see this? If you're a limited government person, if you're a small government person, like I'm, I was in the room at the founding of the Tea Party in Indiana in 2010. I am watching, waiting to see what Don Bates and Richard Bainey and all these people that were in the room too. Uh, Bainey was there. I don't know if Bates was. Uh, how do they handle this? Let's see what the Tea Party does with uh, – because it was all about the 10th Amendment back 10 years ago when Barack Obama was president. Are you still for the 10th, 10th Amendment or are you going to stand up for Donald Trump? You know, I thought there was a specific person who, who invented the Tea Party, oh. moment, wasn't there? <laughs> Uh, weirdly, she, she was she not was in the room. Yeah, it's, it's, Ooh, that's it's weird. It's interesting because you know, since she created it, I figured she would have yeah. been there. Yeah, and, and – you know, she Lisa makes a good point. It wasn't so if he wasn't such a damned baby who throws tantrums every time he's asked something. <laughs> the reality is that Donald Trump, we're all kind of tired of living through whatever he is tantruming about that day. Like instead of talking about the the very real complex issues facing society, he plays the press and his supporters so well that these comments that we that we started with today are not what will be discussed when this episode is posted tomorrow because he's now defunding the World Health Organization. Uh, I, you know, it, it's already all over social media. That's what people are talking about. So instead of having the conversation about the stuff that we need to talk about, we're now having conversations about what Trump versus the, what, what petty fights this man is having every day. Uh, he's fighting with Cuomo one day and the governors one day and then it's the press the next and then it's the who and... And then it's the Led Zeppelins. And then, so it's just it's like, you yeah. can't get a break with this guy. And so it, it's just exhausting. And he illustrates a lot of stuff. And, and I'm exhausted by it. I'm done. That's what he wants. He wants to well, I mean, that's what's going to cost him. Yeah. That's, gonna, that's what it's going to cost him in the election because people are tired of it. And they know that it's coming from him. They're, they're identifying that it's coming from him. He's instigating it. Yeah. And they want to go back to some sort of normalcy. Um, and that's what you're going to end up getting, I think. Yeah, but Biden? I don't know if Biden qualifies as normal. I don't think, it, like I said, it could have been a wet shirt. Yeah, and I, It could have been a wet shirt that they put up that would beat Donald Trump. And by God, they, they decided to put up a wet shirt. No, right. That's what they did in 2016 with Hillary. They put up a wet shirt. No, no. Hillary was a hated shirt with holes in it that everybody <laughs> stank and everybody wanted to get rid of. Real bad could kill you. <laughs> <laughs> she and she, and he only won by seventy thousand votes, right? Yeah. Against mm -hmm. that, and Biden is not as hated as as Hillary yeah. was. But but if Biden gets up there, and I mean Donald is really good at sticking meme names on people. I mean, he really has already got his mean name for him. He's had Sleepy Joe for two months or six yeah, months or however long. Gonna be, it's going to be forgetting. It's, it's not making any difference. The polling numbers are telling the tale. I mean, it's 
a lot of that stuff's not going to stick. I don't think. As I said, poll numbers are, are going to be, if this was happening and I, you and I talked about this offline, <laughs> if, if this is happening, if this pandemic is happening in September and October, I'm a hundred percent on board with it. He loses bad, but you know, third quarter numbers will be coming out right in that time frame. Mm -hmm. And if we've got any sort of decent recovery, and I'm not talking back to where it was in February, but I mean, if we've got decent numbers where unemployment starts to look somewhat normal, then I think there, there's a different story there for him. But we'll see. Speaking of po polling, before we go to Harry, uh, our friend Abdul over at Indy Politics did some polling here in the state of Indiana where Holcomb has not been too, I mean, he's been heavy handed like all the governors, but he's not been like Whitmer bad at all. Uh, you can still go to restaurants or, or for takeout. Uh, I went to Meyer today to get my weekly groceries, that sort of thing. Um, so the his poll was a thousand Hoosiers, and I think libertarians need to hear this because they don't understand that they're living in an echo chamber and that most people are not with them, uh, and they're not messaging in the right way. So a new poll of a thousand Hoosiers uh, said sixty three percent of likely voters approved how Holcomb was addressing COVID twenty COVID nineteen twenty three disapproved and twelve percent had no opinion. Votes were more split down the middle when it came to how Trump was doing forty nine percent approved and 45 percent disapproved and uh as you you've seen that approval rating kind of drop a little bit so by and large most people may approve you know by 60 percent of how their governor's doing and then 50 50 on trump um it showed hoosiers are very concerned with the pandemic with a majority 58 percent saying they have very serious concerns 17 percent saying they have minor concerns or no concerns at all so everybody's very worried about this uh, a large majority of voters, 70%, say they have very serious concerns about a lack of PPE for doctors. <laughs> Obviously, these questions were written a week ago, and my, how things change. Uh, nearly two-thirds of voters say they have very serious concerns about companies going out of business and cuts to education, healthcare, and infrastructure in Indiana. So 75% have very serious concerns about the economy. Uh, despite these key economic concerns, voters are less likely to say they have very serious concerns about taking social distance measures too far and hurting the co economy. Only 33% of those surveyed said that they have very con serious concerns. So if you think about 50-50 of the country being a Republican, especially in a red state like Indiana, where it may be 60-40, 33% of the ho those Hoosiers polled have very serious concerns about the government shutdown. Uh, by comparison, 32% of voters say they have very concerns about dying from coronavirus. So th people are more worried about the economy and the and other people than they are about themselves. Only 32% are actually worried about an existential threat from coronavirus, uh, which kind of tells you that they'll make good decisions, but they also kind of, this is a little bit, uh, they're persuaded by what they read and hear. 14% um, say they lost their jobs or had been laid off. 13% said they lost hours or income. 7% say they're afraid of losing their job. And 31% of voters say they feel secure in their jobs. The remainder said they were already unemployed. Um, so 81% of Indiana approves of the shelter-in-place order. 18% oppose. So 81% of Hoosiers are okay with the government shutdowns. Uh, so voters are in, are generally in support of all measures taken by significant margins, Abdul writes. Closing schools is the most controversial. 88% of people supported closing schools. Um, prohibiting evictions and foreclosures or disconnecting services, all prohibited. Uh, prohib prohibited. 90% support. Mm -hmm. uh, most intense support is for prohibiting utilities disconnection services with 83% of likely voters saying they strongly support it. Um, voters also favored the state government enforcing regulations over making recommendations or playing little to no role during the outbreak. 58% of voters say the state should enforce emergency regulations to keep people safe, while 38% say the state should just make recommendations and people can decide for themselves. So 58% wanted action and 38% uh, say they should just make recommendations for you data nerds, 1,021 interviews from April 10th to the 13th. Uh, 
likely voters margin of error is 3.1 percent and based on 2016 votes so strong favorables for the the shelter in place orders how do you guys read that well I just people it's, are it's yeah it's pretty indicative of what we're seeing around the country the uh whitmer is in the 60 percent range on approval ratings uh Gavin Newsom, California, is in low 80s. Uh, Cuomo's in the mid to upper 80s percent. And these are all pl- approval ratings for these governors. So in a time of crisis like this, when, when something's happening and you have a leader get up and just seem competent, uh, the, the people will rally behind that. We saw that in, in 9-11. We saw that uh, several times in the past as well. People will rally, will rally behind that. I mean, look at uh, George Bush Sr. when he went into Kuwait to kick Iraq out of Kuwait, right? So his numbers went up in the 70s. So being a competent leader, your, your poll numbers will skyrocket, mm-hmm. except for Trump didn't. Right. right? He got he well, got like a 4% bump and he's down 2.5% <laughs> off of that now. Which I think kind of is telling. I think it kind of shows you that he is more vulnerable than we may think because he should Cause he, be. He's, because he's not he's not going up there and he's doing the things that people want a leader to do. He's yeah. acting in his uh, petulant, childish manner uh, trying to pass off blame. Remember, Truman was loved dearly because he said the buck stops here. He took responsibility for everything. And Trump said that in 2013, I think it was, where he said that the whoever's in charge, whoever's the president, he owns it, whether it's his fault or not. It's his fault. Yep. And now he's acting like it's everybody else's fault but him on everything. Fauci, it's people Fauci. are seeing that. We need to fire when it's, Yeah. It, it's, it, people are seeing that at a time when uh, he's on there every day. Imagine being, we're starting to notice this. I yeah. Think. Imagine being the president of the United States and you're blaming a low level bureaucrat mm-hmm. for destroying your economy. The bureaucrat that you issued his CDC guidelines, you're the one who had to sign off on that shit. Like, it's just unbelievable how and, and people buy it. They, they they fall for it left and right. This this happens all the time in corporate America, though. CEO makes a poor decision based on, yep, based on a poor decision, based on data. And not my fault. I'm sorry that, you know, we decided to spin off the company and do stock buybacks and for three, four billion dollars, which would have floated us for for five, six years or, you know, for a year or so. Uh, sorry that we did all the stock buybacks to make my numbers look good. Now all of a sudden I need five billion dollars from you to keep the airlines going. Mm-hmm. Right. You you yeah. fire the, the CFO yeah. instead of taking responsibility. Right. CFO and the CFO doesn't doesn't exactly like walk out the door in handcuffs. He's walking out with his lovely little right. you know separation right. package and things like that. And he'll go be a CFO somewhere else. And but the problem is you can't do that to the government except when you kick them out of office and the next person in line uh, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. So again, you get right back to it. But that's the thing that's why the feds are so horrible at this is that there's no delineation of power. There's nobody that wants to do anything. And frankly, the other side goes, well, our guy's less stupid. So here you go. Yeah. The, the, you have to remember who benefits Qui bono, who benefits from saying this, who benefits if Donald Trump wants to fire Fauci, who benefits right. for what reason? Like you're telling me he's such a weak president that he got bamboozled by Anthony Fauci. You're telling me that you want to fire Fauci because your president is so easily manipulated and persuaded <laughs> that mm-hmm. Anthony Fauci, this mm-hmm. little, this mm-hmm. meek man. Tough guy. Yeah. Right. He came in yeah. and forced your big, strong, tough Donald Trump to issue these CDC guidelines that the governor started following left and right. right. Um, that's, that's your that. argument is that your president is so feeble minded that he got bamboozled by a low level bureaucrat that has just survived five administrations it's just so stupid hoodwinked Hoodwinked. so uh if it it, cockamamie stories everywhere just remember like who who benefits if somebody's pushing the idea that is not mainstream who benefits from that Hmm. wonder why ron paul's targeting an anti-vax message when he has a homeschooling curriculum right like who benefits yep so you have to ask yourself these questions uh Harry, Final. all right. I'm kind of glad out of all the tyrants that have been charged of the landmass known as the United States, um, I'm kind of glad it is Trump in charge uh, right now because of the simple fact that everyone is so hyper focused at him and what he's doing and not going to want to let him keep these powers. They would they would allow 
all those other tyrants keep the damn power keep let them say what they want and just go with it because right now so many people are scared and it's kind of neat and kind of amazing to watch people who like all about about want a strong federal government to do all the things to now they're like all right now we want to do a 10th amendment now we want to do all this now this is great this is great this is great we're having these type of conversations um the other thing is uh I wanted to go ahead uh, and tell people out there is uh, once again, as you are creating these small communities and these great friendships in your little private Facebook groups or anything else, get off those platforms. They're killing you. They're actively killing you. They're the reason why you didn't get this information. They're the reason why you didn't get this information only from Joe Rogan's podcast and other things like that. It's because anytime anyone wants to share that information, it was stopped. These platforms are killing you. Get off. Find another way to get the information. Get off the damn platform. Going back Leave to it. incentives, these algorithms incentivize stupid. Yep, they do. Uh, get off. Yeah. Get off. Get off YouTube. Get off Facebook. You know. Get off. They're going to. They're going to. You know. They're. You heard them. They wanted to start using your pocket of sensors called a phone. They want to use this to track you. This is in, uh, insecure. No matter what, no matter what platform, no matter which version you have, it's unsecure. You can't secure it. Get away from it. Use just it as a phone. Put it down. Get away from it. Okay, it's okay. Use something else. And just be says don't because well, mine doesn't have a uh, you know like if it has a GSM antenna in it or a CDM antenna. Guess what? It talks to the tower's ear regardless. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay. Get off those systems, Craig. Decau- uh, by the way, look at the comment. Craig kind of got you there. <laughs> yep, yep. He says, wait, I'm on one of those platforms you're watching right now. Right. Yeah, and it's okay to jack the signal because you can't stop it to get out and tell people to leave. You know, you're not going to fault someone to going back in the city. Like, hey, you probably should get away from this. This is going to kill you. You should walk away. I, I have I have deleted the Facebook app from my phone this week because my yeah. thing. I always needed to have these apps on my phone because I was at work. I had mm-hmm. to work with these apps, and there's a couple times where I've had to download it to do a specific action. Mm-hmm. But I've deleted Twitter and Facebook off my phone completely because I'm like, I don't. I, I need to make the choice to go walk over to the computer. Mm-hmm. I want to go yes. share post right. Use it through uh, the browser. Do I Stop need? It? Do I need to spend, spend all day? So, all right. For my final thing, this is from the. Imagine if you're reading this in 1989 desk. Uh, Roger Stone suggested Monday that Bill Gates may have a hand in the creation of coronavirus so that he could plant microchips in people's heads to know who has and has not been tested for COVID-19. Whether Bill Gates played some role in the creation and spread of this virus is open for vigorous debate, he said. I have conservative friends who say it's ridiculous and others who say absolutely. Stone told Joe Piscopo host of the radio program on oh, 970 well, AM. Well, oh, oh, it's Joe Piscopo? Oh, well, then never mind. I'm sorry. I, I was going to ridicule it there for a second. <laughs> he he said he from New Jersey? <laughs> yeah. He said regarding uh r- regarding uh President Trump, he and other global uh but Bill Gates and other globalists are using it for mandatory vaccinations and microchipping people so we know that if they've been tested over my dead body. Uh, mandatory vaccines? No way, Jose. He told about uh, Donald Trump, who he said is a legend. Uh, now there have there has been now, Bill Gates has said some things along those lines, and to, which prompted Bill Barr to actually come out and say, "As long as I, I will never allow microchipping of people if if I am a, Attorney General." So, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, just Roger Stone talking to Joe Piscopo about President Trump. Just what a if you want to know about the uh, degeneration of society and the just how far we're okay. Um, he, thank wasn't, you. he wasn't doing this from a jail cell, right? Where he's supposed to be at. He's still uh, waiting, set, waiting to go yeah. to jail. I think. I believe so. I believe he did this. Uh, <laughs> you know, the other thing I want to play for people that I I really liked was. I have never been a huge Chris Cuomo fan. I have always thought that he's part of the problem, and I always thought that he was kind of dent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he always is kind of hyperventilating. And in my uh, d- 
de-evolution into watching cable news since I've been uh, working from home, which is why if you follow me on Twitter, it's basically me just talking to Twitter about the cable news because I'm lonely, uh, like an old man. Um, you know, he before he got the corona, he was pretty, he was getting okay. And then during corona, he was even better. And then I heard him say this today on his radio show. Because... I don't want to spend my time doing things that I don't think va are valuable enough to me personally. Like what? Well, I don't like what I do professionally, I've decided. Um, I like doing this show. I like talking to you guys. But I don't value indulging irrationality hyperpartisanship. I don't think it's worth my time. And I don't want some jackass loser fat tire biker um to be able to pull over uh and get in my face and in my space. Oh man, I am an idiot. I am I apologize. Hold um on. to be able to pull over uh and get in my face and in my space and talk bullshit to me. I don't want to hear it. And just like you would, right? You, you're not going to tolerate that, right? Some cat just basically pulls up in the driveway next to yours and starts getting in your face about stuff. How, how's that going to go? How's that going to go, right? That matters to me more than making millions of dollars a year. That matters to me more. Why? Because I've saved my money. Yeah, so I don't know if he's quitting, but it certainly sounds like maybe he'll think a little more about how he does a show. And I invite everyone to go listen to the most recent Common Sense with Dan Carlin. Uh, it is absolute art as everything Dan Carlin does, and he's so right on. And uh, please, go listen to the episode uh, Inviting Caesar or something with Caesar in the title. Dan Carlin's Common Sense. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to Brian and Reinhold and uh, Harry for being here. And we appreciate you watching online. We typically do the show on Tuesday evenings at 7 Eastern. So if you want to watch on Tuesday nights uh, for the notification, go sign up on the YouTube and get the alerts when we post a video. We, we, we try to do full video of everything that we do now. Uh, and you can watch the stream, participate in the comments. Really enjoyed having, uh, you know, Lisa and Dion and Craig and some other people uh, participating while we did this. That was a nice touch. It was fun. Uh, and so we'll continue to do more of that. Thank you to uh, all the viewers like Jeff. And uh, we really do appreciate it. So if you enjoyed this, if you learned something, then please share it, share it, share it, share it, share it. You have no idea. Like the two episodes in the last couple of weeks have been already there. I mean, they're five times bigger than what we normally do. Uh, and it's really starting to grow. People are starting to pay attention. We're trying to do something different. I think we have content that is, um, I, I just, I think we have the best podcast in the entire world. And I, I, if you agree, then please share that. I would uh, really appreciate that. So thank you, everybody, for watching and uh, help us grow. We really do appreciate it. Thanks to our patrons. And thank you guys for being here. We will see you next week. See you.